COVID-19, it's, it's all over the news, or SARS-CoV-2, or coronavirus, and, and nobody wants to get it, right? <laughs> I don't want to get it. I know several people who did contract COVID-19, and thankfully they've recovered in full strength. But nobody wants to get COVID-19. And so I pull into the Speedway gas station, and on the screen, they're saying, stay safe, stay at home, wear a mask, so on. This is what the authorities, the, the medical experts and the best, most authoritative epidemiologists are saying to, to do certain things in order to stay safe so we don't get COVID-19, right? This pandemic seems to be holding no exclusions, no exceptions. It's in, almost in every country, I believe, in the globe, uh, all across airports and train stations, in small little villages, in cow towns, to large metropolitan areas, COVID-19 seems to be everywhere. It seems like nobody, no matter how far you hide, maybe in a little tiny cabin in northern Alaska, maybe you'd not get near it, but it's a pandemic. It's everywhere. And, and all the authorities give us various ways to help escape or hide or, or not contract the virus. And, but I've talked to doctors, and, and ultimately, they'll say, we don't really know for sure. All those efforts may be noble and worthwhile, but the best experts, the authorities tell us still, don't really know for sure. That's, that's what I hear. Is that what you hear? Don't really know for sure. But do this and do this and do this because we got to try to not get COVID-19. And if someone were to get COVID-19, they would hope for sure that there's a good medication or a cure or something that they could do to get over it quickly. But there is one thing that we know for sure. There is one authority that speaks to one thing that is for certain, that there is a different kind of pandemic. There is a sickness that is in every human being on earth. We're born into the sin sickness. We're born into depravity. We're born separated from God. We're born with this hostility. There isn't peace between broken depraved human beings, and the righteous, holy creator God. We're born with this stain of sin, this sin sickness that has no exclusions, no exception clauses in this. It's in every country, man, woman, and child. We're born into this sin sickness. Now, we don't sin. We, we, don't, we, we aren't sinners just because or when we sin. We we're sinners because it's who we are. We're, we're sinners to the core. We, you can't help but not sin, it seems. Hey, adults, we adults, we face the pull of this sin nature every time we're faced with a temptation toward greed or envy or lust or power. Teenagers face this pull of this pandemic of sin every time they have that slip of profanity. It's not really much of a slip because it was already right there. Or a selfish intent over a situation, over a relationship, or watching an immoral movie. This pull is felt in adults, is felt in teens, and even in kids. And because, of course, our Thrive Kids only goes up to five years old, we have kids in the house right now. I'm looking for my daughter wherever she is, somewhere in here. Ah, there's Everlyn and Christian, my nephew. And even as sweet as they are, even as sweet as my three-year-old Carson is, this pandemic of sin still is in his heart. Every time he looks up and says, no! Parents, you know what I'm talking about. They, wait, you're my sweet no, Carson or my sweet daughter Everlyn. But wait a minute, I was one of those sweet kids too. Well... You can ask my mom about that. <laughs> but the stain of sin, it's like a disease 
clutching at the heart of every human being. When kids act out in defiance or disobedience, and teens and adults, we, we shake our fists in God's face, as it were, and say, we want our way, not your way. It's the age-old temptation all the way back to the beginning of the story of gar of, in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, to believe the lie of that serpent of old, Satan, instead of the word of God, to put our faith in ourselves rather than our trust in our Creator. It spares no one, it's in every country, it's in every age, man, woman, and child, we face this pandemic of sin. Is there a cure, though? And we're all looking for a cure, right? There's a, a doctor in our church who serves on our deacon board, and many of you know him, and, and I'm sure he is anticipating that day when there may be a vaccine or a cure for COVID-19. But is there a cure for the ultimate sickness of sin, this pandemic that spares no one, and it's clutching us right within. There is an authority, there is an authority who has a cure, and his name is Jesus Christ. There is a cure, brothers and sisters, friends here this morning. There is a cure for sin sickness, and it's in the authority of Jesus the Christ. But how do we know that? Some of you may be still seeking or skeptical. Or some of you may need a refresher like me of, okay, I know confessionally that's true because I read my our doctrinal statement or I was in Sunday school when I was a kid and I, I, I love Jesus, but, but how do I know that cure works? And how is that explained in the scriptures that on the basis of the authority of Jesus Christ, there is a cure for sin sickness? How, how do I know that? How is that displayed? I want to answer that question together with you, discover in a story together that reveals the authority that proves that he has a cure to the ultimate sin sickness disease that lies within everybody on earth. The Holy Spirit had come upon the church, established the church, birthed, the day of Pentecost, and Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, stands up and preaches to masses of people who see this amazing, extraordinary event take place, that people were speaking in languages that they didn't know, that they hadn't learned. They weren't languages from their birth, and that they're speaking them clearly so that people all gathered there on the day of Pentecost could understand the wonderful works of God in their own local language from many different nations. And Peter stands up and he preaches of this Jesus the Christ. Jesus, the name means God saves or God in his salvation to his people. And Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one of God, come to save us, rescue us, establish the kingdom of God. And so he stands up and he explains with Old Testament references and parallels to what had just occurred just months before in Jesus' words and his works and then his death and his glorious resurrection. And an amazing thing happens. 3,000 souls come to faith in Jesus Christ. Don't skip over that. That's huge. 3,000 people like that at the preachment of the gospel, come to faith in Jesus Christ. And the, the church becomes this tightly knit community of people, and they're meeting every day in the temple courts, praying together and worshiping together and expounding on the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, the, the law and the prophets, and pointing to how Jesus is in every page of scripture. The theme of the Messiah is all throughout the Old Testament. So they're explaining, and they're helping each other with their needs, providing for one another, and and as the Lord guides it, the church is growing day by day as he builds his family, the church. Next scene, you could say act one in a five-act drama that encompasses Acts chapter three and Acts chapter four. Turn there with me. And in this passage, we're going to see another amazing, extraordinary event. An amazing thing happens, incredible. And we're going to see 
three steps about Christ's authority, but more than that, how does that apply to us right now in the way that we say, look what God has done, see who God has sent, and turn from sin to God. Stand with me now. I want to make this interactive here because I'm still kind of a kid at heart, if you can't tell. Turn with me to Acts chapter 3, verses 1 and following. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 and following. This is one of those stories that has been put into kids' songs. Just listen to it with fresh ears. Open your heart to God's sanctifying truth right now. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the hour of prayer. This was the second of three daily prayer times for godly Jews. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms, ask people for money, of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. Alms for the poor, alms for the poor. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Walk! What? And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and jumping and praising God. Now here, I want kids to do something, all right? And if you're a kid at heart, you can do this too. I want you to jump up and down and wave your arms, all right? Because we need to see what's happening here. Are you ready? All right, Keegan, are you a kid at heart? You can jump up and down and wave your arms because this man who had been lame from the time he was in his mother's belly is now walking and leaping and praising God. Oh, let's see it on the count of three. One, two, three. Here's what's happening. All right, he's going like this. This guy who had been laid there at the temple court gate for, some of you didn't really get in. We need to try this again. Okay, walking and jumping and praising God right? Because something amazing, amazing, amazing happened here. Incredible. And all the people saw him. All right, just like you who are acting so reverential, you saw the other people walking and jumping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him. That's a nice way to say, I mean, they were just taking note. They weren't getting a post-it note. Translation needs to help us out with the Greek a little bit there. They were like, wait, this is the guy who always sat at that, the, the gate called Beautiful, which is in, the main entrance into the temple courts, near the court of the women and the court of the Gentiles. And, and so they're going, that's, that's, that's him, that, the guy that always sits there in rags asking for money for his entire life. He was the one at that beautiful gate, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Shocked at what had happened to him. All right, you can take a seat. Kids, thank you for jumping up and down and praising God. This is the ultimate sermon introduction, guys. I mean, really. You know, it, it, pastors try to come with a story or a question or an image, a picture, something to use as a hook into the message. And Peter, he, he has the ultimate sermon intro here because the ultimate goal of a sermon introduction is to have everybody's attention. He has everybody's attention. Everybody is going, 
what is going on? We know this guy. He was lame from birth. He came out, and his parents, most likely, would have been carrying him on a stretcher and sitting him down at the gate and, and, and saying, you know, okay, ask him for money. And so every morning and every afternoon at each prayer time, because that's when people be flowing in and out, and their hearts may be warmed by something they had heard, maybe from the prophet Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, and they'd come out of the temple and they would give him some money. Or as they were going in, preparing their heart for worship, they'd give him a little bit of coin. And every day he was through this routine and every day people knew that they'd see the same person. And you know the way people who beg operate. You've seen them. I I think I've seen them here in the U.S. and other countries. And they're always looking, you see, looking, looking like this because they want to catch the eye, your eye. Because if they catch your eye, Dan, over there, and you look in my eye, maybe something will happen here, and you'll give me some money, right? Because it's hard to look away when you see the eye of someone who's begging for money. And so people with street smarts, and I have found myself doing this at times, right? You walk in the streets of Chicago or, or Hyderabad, India, or something, and there's lots of people asking for money, and... And I, I th- I've done this, you say, you know, to somebody next to you maybe who doesn't have street smarts. Don't, don't look at them. Don't look at them. No, don't, don't just, you know, just keep walking. You've done that, right? Probably. Yeah. Peter and John do the exact opposite thing. They say, look at us. Look at us. If that man had... had, had st- stopped looking around, he's saying, okay, I'm going to give that that guy over there, my attention, because I think he may be giving me some money. So he's got to take his attention away from everybody else, trying to make that eye connection with somebody, so they give him some money. So he looks right at Peter and John, and Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I be. What I do have, in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the name signifies Christ's authority. This isn't Peter's authority. This isn't Peter's power. This isn't a magic formula that Peter attaches or that we might attach onto the end of a prayer as some sort of fancy way of something that's going to happen. No, it's a, it's a confession, a profession of faith in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus, God saves, Christ the Messiah, the Nazarene, identifying with the people, their humanity. Fully man, fully God. And all the miracles in the book of Acts are pointing out that Jesus is alive. That's the purpose of the miracles in the book of Acts. It's a different purpose than what you see in the Gospels. When Jesus would perform a miracle, it was to establish him as he is his authority over sin and death and sickness and illness, but this is pointing to his authority and that he is alive, and it would then authenticate the apostles' message that Jesus Christ is alive, this Jesus then whom Peter will preach. And so this whole scene is exploding in the temple courts. This man who everybody knows because they're they're, they're the daily walking past him, maybe throwing in a coin here or there. He's walking, and he's jumping up and down, and he's praising God. And to praise means what? It means to say, look what God has done. That's simply what praise means. Look what God did. And I wonder how many times, as a simple step, you and I could simply say, look what God has done in my life. And that is the first step for people to understand with wonder and amazement that Jesus is alive. Don't hold back from telling people across the table at the restaurant or at the gas station or your neighbor that you're building a relationship with or your your co-worker across the cubicle to just simply say, look, look, look what God has done in my life. Look what God did. And so this man is saying, look what God did. Did. He's not saying what Peter and John did. He's saying what Jesus Christ the Nazarene has done in his life. Only Christ has the authority to grant instant healing to physical illness. That's, that's point number one. Only Christ has the authority to grant instant healing to physical illness. 
It was only on the basis of Christ's authority and through and delegated to the Apostle Peter that this man is healed. It's not Peter, it's Christ. It's Peter pointing to Jesus Christ. And it calls us to look and, and to say, look what God has done. Look what God has done in our lives. That's the first act in the five acts seen in Acts chapter 3 and 4. Now look with me in verse 11, 12, 13, the next scene here. While he was clinging or holding on to Peter and John, you seeing this? He's holding on to them because he's ecstatic and everybody is blown away by what's just happened. He's holding on to them and all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon. This is verse 11, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? And or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety, we had made him walk? It's not look at us, it's look at what God did. Right? So when we share the story of God's grace in our lives, we make it all about Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. And as you read over this passage too, this man being healed, it gives you pause because I know very closely, even with my wife's own constant health struggles, and many of you have faced chronic illnesses or maybe you're facing a sickness and illness and, and you've been asking God to take it away for maybe your entire life. And we know that Christ has the authority to instantly grant physical healing to physical illness, right? Do you agree with that? Only Christ, but he does. Only Christ can do it instantly. Now, he could say, you know, my cousin who's a doctor or his wife who's a doctor, they could provide the, the medicines, the care to bring about eventual healing in a person's life, but only Christ can bring instant healing. That immediately blood flows back into this man's limbs and his ligaments and his joints. They all go into operation like that. I, and I see that scene as not that he was laying down at the, on the ground at that point, but people were actually carrying him along at this point on the stretcher. If you look really closely in New American Standard Translation and the Net Translation, you'll see that they do a good job with the Greek there, that he's being actually carried along and Peter and John are walking along and at this moment, he's, he's there on the stretcher, these people are holding him and Peter stretches out his right hand and pulls him off the stretcher and immediately he jumps out and starts walking, right? Instant. Well, what about that? We'd all want... Instant eradication. We want this to be gone immediately, don't we? Instant eradication of COVID-19, right? Do you want that? I'm that? We all want it to go away now, <laughs> and it won't, it seems. I mean, this has been going on since who knows when. That's debatable. <laughs> More about that at the end of Peter's message, because there is a hope about your long-term illness. So Peter, he gives these questions, these rhetorical questions to the crowds. Everybody's running around and excited. And he says, why are you looking at us? No, don't gaze at us. There's a beautiful play on words. It's actually all throughout this chapter. I was amazed. As you look over the text, you see, Verse 4, Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and says, look at us, right? And then you see that the people, he says, you know, why do you gaze at us, right? As if by our own power or piety, we, we made him walk. This man had to give his attention to Peter and John to hear this proclamation of Christ's authority. And now the people are staring at Peter and John, just like the man did. So Peter is going to now stand up and proclaim Christ's authority. Isn't that neat? Verse 13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered 
and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. Peter is now going to proclaim that not only only Christ has the authority to grant instant healing to physical illness, but only Christ has the authority to be the Lord of Israel's history. To this Jewish audience, there in the temple courts, he's going to proclaim that Jesus Christ is the I am. No mistakes about it. No, no buts about it. That Christ has the authority to be the Lord, the King of Israel's history. And so he's saying, as our forefathers, he's identifying himself with them. I'm in this family of Abraham. And this one who he's going to identify is part of this. It's this from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. And this is a theme throughout the prophet Isaiah that the Messiah will be the servant, suffering servant. And Jesus is the servant identified in Isaiah. They wouldn't have missed this. Remember, they're in the temple. They knew the scrolls. And so he says, this you delivered, this servant, Jesus, servant, God saves, that one. They did three things. Look with me in verse 14. But you disowned the holy and righteous one. There is another name that was reserved for Yahweh in the Old Testament, the one true and living God, the holy and righteous one. You disowned him. You treated him as an outcast. You utterly rejected him. And number two, and asked for a murder to be granted to you. You asked for him to be murdered. You disowned him. You rejected him. And then you asked for him to be killed. And then number three, but you put to death the originator of life. Your translation might say the prince of life or the author of life. The best translation I could say is the originator of life. He's the leader of life and the source of life. That's who the servant Jesus, who's the holy and righteous one, he's the one who's the originator of life. They could not misinterpret what Peter's saying here, that Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, is the Lord of Israel's history. He's not walking on eggshells. He's stomping on the eggshells. You love that? That's what Holy Spirit preaching should do. Jesus is king. No prime minister, president, parliament. Jesus is king, yeah. right? He was the Lord of Israel's history. He's the Lord of our story, too. Asked, put to death the prince of life, the one whom, ah, and here's the irony twist, right? The one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses, because they put to death the originator of life, and only the originator of life has the authority to defeat death and then grant us eternal life. Only God himself could do that. So they had their plan. We're going to silence this. We're going to quell this thing here. We're going to put him to death. And the one who's the source of life overturns death, defeats it, conquers victory over sin and death so that we could have eternal, the forever life in him. And we're all witnesses. We saw it all happen, Peter reminds them. On the basis of faith in his name, that is, his authority, okay? His authority. It is the name of Jesus Christ, his position, his power, his authority recognized, which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. This man is completely healed instantaneously on the basis of Christ's authority. And this Christ is also the Lord of Israel's history. So the question remains then, so now, Peter will say, brothers and sisters, what are you going to do about it? Because you disowned him, asked for him to be murdered, and put him to death. But he rose from the dead. What are you going to do with Jesus who's alive? Jesus who is alive. What are you going to do with that? And so he continues, and now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance. He's saying, okay. Oh, unintentional sin. They, they, they didn't know what they were doing when they shouted out, yeah, free Barabbas. Kill Jesus. Crucify him. Crucify him. The same people in that crowd. God extends grace to them now. So there's hope. 
just as your rulers did also. But verse 18, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Again, the prophets foretold the theme of Scripture is Christ and the coming kingdom. And Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of those Old Testament prophecies concerning him. And so that he, verse 20, that he may send Jesus, oh, excuse me, that his Christ would suffer, he, and he has thus fulfilled, verse 19, therefore, therefore, because of all this, because you've just seen this amazing sermon introduction, this man you know was lame from birth, is walking and leaping and praising God, and that Christ who healed him is alive, and he's the Lord of Israel's history. Therefore, you need to repent and return. It's simple. Look with me in verse 19. Therefore, repent, which means to turn to God. Turn to him. To repent means to change and it's an intellectual, it's a volitional, it's a heart contrition that says, in my mind and my will, my emotions, I'm turning from my own way, and I'm turning to God's invitation of grace and mercy and pardon in Jesus Christ. Because, why? Because only Christ has the authority to grant instant healing to sin sickness. Here's the beautiful logic of this narrative that Luke, the doctor, gave us. There was a man who was sick from birth, and everyone knew it. And there were the crowds who were sick from birth, but none of them knew it. So Peter proclaims, just as this man was healed of his physical illness, there is hope of forgiveness, the offer of redemption. If you turn, you can be healed of your sin sickness. But you have to recognize it. You have to see it. So you look at what God has done. You see who God has sent. And you turn from sin to God. That's the core and the simplicity of the gospel proclamation of the Holy Spirit-empowered Peter Repent and return. Why? So that your sins may be, the New American Standard Bible translates it, wiped away. Other translations might say wiped out, might be erased. Now, on the other side of this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spin this around, okay? Bear with me in the squeaky wheels, okay? All the kids, you can, you can jump up and down and wave your arms, all right? Go ahead. Go ahead. It's okay. All right. Here we go. We can't eradicate COVID-19, but think about all this right here. Pride and greed and lies and envy and anger and idolatry and lust and gluttony and oppression and immorality and idleness and bullying and cowardice abuse and theft and all of that, if you turn from sin to God, this is on the basis of Christ's authority with a proof just as that man was healed of his physical illness, there is the evidence that by Christ's authority, all of your sins, I think you probably found some of yours on this. If you did, shout amen, right? They're wiped out. They're wiped out, never to be heard from again. God's word says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us, white, clean, repent, and return to God. This is the simplicity and the beauty and the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. So that your sins may be wiped away, and there's another purpose clause in here. In order that, this is verse 19, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Here's the amazing thing. These, these words and this phrasing of refreshment in the presence of the Lord and restoration are nowhere else found in the New Testament except here. 
It's an amazing picture of what Peter had in his mind that this is the proclamation of the hope of the restoration of Israel, the coming of the kingdom of God's Messiah, Jesus Christ. And back to that first part, you may be dealing with chronic illness, sickness, physical sickness, illness. First, you return and repent, and your sin, sickness, is wiped out. You're healed. Christ is the cure. But there is coming a day when there is refreshment in the presence of the Lord, when we will see him face to face, and everything will be restored, made new, and all the sad things will become untrue. And there will be no more tears, no more crying, no more mourning for the former things will be passed away. Everything will be new, made new again. This is what Peter proclaims to these people and to us, because their hope rests on Christ's authority. Granted, instant physical healness. He's the Lord of Israel's history, but he's also the one who can grant instant forgiveness to the sin sickness in our souls. Restoration, the remaking of all things, the garden new, covering the whole earth. I can't get that out of my head, can you? I mean, it's just like, this is the hope of the gospel. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him, you shall give heed to everything he says. Okay, just like some Christians, you know, he's seen some arms crossed here, all right? And they want cross-references. And these people know the law and the prophets. And so he brings up Deuteronomy 18, 15. And this is what they were looking for. They were looking for this true and better prophet who Moses promised, and they were supposed to listen to him. And Peter says, he's driving the knife in really right here. He says, I know you acted in ignorance, but now you need to return and repent. The one that Moses prophesied about, this one that you're supposed to listen to, the capital P prophet, the true and better Moses, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And he alone has the authority to grant instant healing to your sin sickness. And it will be that every soul, verse 23, that does not heed that prophet, that prophet, say it with me, who is, try it again. I heard somebody back there. Who was it? Who is this, who is this prophet? Jesus. Jesus, right. Who doesn't heed, doesn't listen, shall be utterly destroyed from among the people it means you don't have any place in God's new covenant community. You have no place in God's family if you don't listen to Jesus. That's heavy, and it's true. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days, it is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I was centrifugal force to the whole globe that it's not a cure that you're supposed to keep for yourselves. It's for everybody that Christ alone has the authority to grant instant healing to the sin sickness in everyone's soul. And this is for every language and tribe and nation. And we can all say, thank the Lord, because we can be a part of this family. Verse 26, for you first, God raised up his servant. There it is again from Isaiah 52. His servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. The repentance that Peter is calling the people to, the repentance that Jesus called the people of Israel to is a blessing. It's a gift of God to receive the understanding that you need to repent because we can't in and of ourselves figure this out or turn to God in our own strength. God gives us the gift of repentance through which we can exercise saving faith in his Messiah. First to the house of Israel that they rejected Now to the whole world of which you and I can be a part. Christ alone has the authority to grant instant healing to physical illness. Christ alone has authority as the Lord of Israel's history. And only Christ has the authority to grant instant healing to sin, sickness in our souls. 
Have you told somebody about this? Have I? Look what God has done. See who God has sent. Turn from sin to God. It's that simple. You and I can say it just like that. Share your story. As an adult, you can share with someone about a great story in your life, redemption you've received in Jesus Christ. As a teenager, you're called on mission. You're not out of commission. You're on mission. Just say, look what God has done. Do you see it? See who God has sent. His name is Jesus. Turn from sin to God. This past week, I had lunch with someone, great, great guy. He told me over lunch more about his story again, and he said, you know, for years, I was a raging alcoholic atheist. I hated everything and everybody. I was the most vile person you'd ever run into. I'm eating my chicken shawarma. I'm going, tell me more. He said, and Jesus saved me. Look what God did. See who God has sent. Now, here's what this friend of mine does. He leads people to Jesus. He's a celebrate recovery leader, pointing people to how Jesus can heal them, forgive them, and give them the new forever life in Jesus Christ. God has done that in your life. Maybe not with that identical story, but everybody in here who's in Jesus Christ can say, look, see it? Turn from sin to God. And all your sins can be wiped out. And you can have hope of the refreshment and the presence of the Lord and restoration of all things to come. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? Even so, Lord, in our lives, may we not just hear or see an amazing picture from your word, but respond to deal with the therefore because you are Lord and you've called us to the beauty of your mission to be the sent people of God empowered by your Holy Spirit to point everyone to Jesus Christ the Nazarene so they can walk in you, so they can walk in you. Lord, we pray that we would not be like the crowds or the leaders who would later on reject and refuse, disown and ignore. Lord, I pray for those who may be here who have never taken that step to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. I pray that they would turn from sin to God today to be the day of salvation. I pray, O oh God, that you would pour out your grace and an understanding so that they comprehend the depths of your love in Jesus Christ and turn from their futile efforts to the work complete in Jesus Christ today, this morning, right now. And for all of us who are in Jesus, we pray that we'd regift this, that we would say Christ is the ultimate cure. We wouldn't just keep it for ourselves. Oh, what a crime that would be. We have the cure. Compel us to give it out with joy and with gratitude. In Jesus' name.